Almost none of the experiments I set up during my PhD worked out. In fact, the vast majority of them failed. And so what's very important for you to think about is how you can still save your thesis and graduate in time. And this is what this video is about and we're starting right now. Things can and very likely will go wrong during your PhD. There's no way around it if you're working in an experimental field, but also do other kinds of work in the natural sciences. Uh, things will go wrong. So it's very important to think about what are the contingency plans, what are the backup plans. In short, what is your thesis insurance? So what will make you much more likely to graduate? So you have your beautiful thesis plan. Congratulations, you've written a proposal. It's wonderful. But also don't forget to think about what will you do when specific things in your plan go wrong. And it's important to plan ahead for those kinds of cases. And here's a couple of points what you should potentially think about. Whatever your backup plans are, one of the most important things always, <laughs> generally in many of these topics, is talk to your thesis advisor. Because you may have a beautiful backup plan for your PhD work in case something fails, but maybe it doesn't fit in to the project that your PI has to answer to, for example. So it's basically not acceptable from the framework that your PhD takes place in. So whatever it is, uh, sometimes that's difficult maybe also for you to see. So it's extremely important that you always cross-check your backup plans with your advisor. The second point is consider that there are many, many, many different types of studies and within the potential constraints that your PhD takes place in, think of as many of these options as you can and still basically have um, something done that works towards your goal. And so, for example, if your passion is about field experiments, field experiments are very difficult, they're logistically challenging, they take a long time, um, they may fail. If they fail, it's very difficult to make up for them. So whenever you have field experiments, for example, make sure you also have a backup plan. That is a lab experiment or a greenhouse experiment where you have much higher levels of control and things are therefore less likely to go completely wrong. But don't, all, don't only think in terms of experiments. Maybe you can do an observational study. So maybe if you're studying a particular effect of some driver, maybe you can find an analog of um, this driver in a gradient out there. And then you can sample this gradient and use uh, pertinent statistics to tease out that particular factor that you were interested in. So there's also this option to do observational studies. But even if you're in an experimental lab and if your work is mostly experimental, don't forget that there's also other options for you to drive your thesis forward. And these could be uh, review papers or synthesis papers. They could be systematic reviews. They could be systematic mapping exercises where you really go through the entire literature in a particular field and well, map out where things have already been done and what are the gaps. You can do formal meta-analyses which will probably be quite a learning curve to get into at first, but then um, there's, they're very likely to succeed in some way and they're super unlikely to be a complete failure, uh, these meta-analyses. So you can write opinion papers um, or viewpoint perspective papers. There are so many different options how you can produce output and it's very good that, uh, it's very good to think about how you can in integrate that into your, into your plan. Your real thesis plan as well, but definitely in terms of your backup plan in, in case things go completely wrong. Again, it's important to check this with your advisor because your advisor or your program or whatever uh, may not accept uh, perspective of a, or opinion papers or co-author papers. You know, regulations vary extremely widely among universities, colleges, countries and situations and research fields. So make sure whatever the plan is that it's also okay with your program. Uh, but you know, in our lab, for example, all of these are options and this is communicated to people um, that they should think about these other options as well in addition to the experimental work that our lab mostly does. Returning to the topic of these long-term experiments that require a lot of investment, this might not necessarily be just a long-term field experiment, but it could, any, it could be any other long-term study that you're doing. If they fail, it would be catastrophic for your thesis, right? Because you have invested so much time in them and so much hinges on them being successful. So for those kinds of studies, it 
is especially important to think about what you could do as a backup, you know, like a lab experiment or a greenhouse experiment, as we already mentioned. It's almost crazy to not think of a backup plan and rely on really some of those long-term experiments or observational studies to work out. Because, you know, you cannot rewind time if you need like three field seasons, for example, to get your data, then if this doesn't work out uh, because no pattern shows and nothing interesting comes out, nothing new, or the experiment somehow failed to manifest, <laughs> then, you know, you really have no, not, if you have no backup, you will not graduate in time. So there it's particularly important to think of these uh, fail-safe options. Think about, of course, your experiments that you are doing yourself, where you are taking the lead or you do basically doing everything. But also think in terms of options for collaboration. This was actually in the end what saved me. You know, my experiments basically didn't work out. They failed on a, on a massive scale um, because of equipment failure and other reasons, but basically had I not basically in the end picked up the phone and just called a bunch of people, um, if I could sample their experiment, their field experiment, for example, or their greenhouse experiment, then this would have never worked. I mean, there's, there's no way, uh, because so much time was basically sunk in the failed experiments. So if I had not started thinking really more seriously about collaborations, then this would not have worked. So I can only encourage you to think about how can you also reach some of your goals by collaborating with others? Because maybe some people have already set up an experiment with that factor of interest and you can just come in and sample that experiment, for example. That doesn't necessarily mean you're not first author. You can still be first author on that paper if that experiment was probably set up primarily to measure some other factor. Uh, so they are all mostly fully compatible with you know, publication requirements or various other program requirements, but you know it takes the initiative or your PI's initiative to forge those collaborative relationships and so this requires networking. And so if you want to check out some of those other videos on networking, this is where this comes in very handy because then you can just tap into somebody else's experiment, observational study, whatever have you. Mind you, of course, these collaborations also take effort and time. You know, there's time required to negotiate, maybe you have to go to a different place, um, but in the end <laughs> it's definitely what saved me. So I'm a bit, since that time I'm just very enthusiastic about collaborating because you can add your expertise to other people's projects and this way you can also you know, make up for things that didn't work during your PhD. So think about collaborations. Collaborations, for example, with your um, team members, the member of the same lab, you know, that one time maybe you take the lead on something and somebody else helps you with your particular project and then the roles are reversed in the next project where maybe somebody else takes the lead and you contribute. Again, you know, it's important to talk with your mentor and check with program requirements if you're a second author on a paper, if you can still use it in your thesis. Here you can, but in many other places potentially you cannot. So it's important to uh, get sort of the, <laughs> the general framework right. But collaborations, uh, what really can save your day in the end when other things fail. And also generally, it increases your productivity and your output. And that's always good also during a PhD, not only after your PhD. Well, then another point is to look at a different angle of your data or your results. Maybe your experiment or your observational study didn't quite use the results or the data patterns that you thought they would. But you know, rather than throwing it all out and declaring it an utter failure, is there some way you can look at this somehow, still fulfill your project goals and get something else interesting out of it that is still new and interesting? Uh, this also happened to me, not during my PhD, but afterwards. So we had um, a complete failure for some um, AM fungi to colonize plants. And then we still had, for example, effects of these different inocula of different fungi, even though the fungi were, were dead or at least not viable at the time of the experiment. And that got you to thinking, well, what was it about the inoculum that could have potentially caused this effect? So it really <laughs> led actually to something very interesting and a grant proposal that was eventually funded and also some papers and interesting thinking and conceptual developments. It started with basically creatively thinking about, well, this went wrong or this didn't really go the way I thought or this is not the pattern that I ex had expected. Very often, those are potentially very interesting things, so don't throw these out. Try to think of things from a different angle. 
Maybe you can also not use your entire experiment. Maybe your experiment as a uh, your entire experiment is sort of overall not working out well. But maybe there's also uh, smaller aspects of that experiment that you can still use for like a smaller chapter or a part of a chapter and therefore you know contribute to the volume of data that is required to earn a PhD. So um, as we design experiments and think about you know what we want to have answered by this experiment or observational study mostly is, uh, about experiments though then we tend to throw in more and more factors or variables to or parameters to consider you know this is not necessarily at the response variable side of things so you measure more and more stuff but you just make the experimental design more and more complex by throwing in another factor, another condition, or by having additional sampling points and things like that. And so that makes things more complicated. You have more parameters to consider and therefore there's also more opportunities for things to go wrong. It's just the way it is. You know, if you have another inoculation, for example, with another fungus type or with another um, soil organism, or whatever it is that you work on, there is a chance that that will fail and if that is really important for your question it can like drag down your entire experiment and so therefore i think it's just really important yes i mean i think everybody will will at some point make these complex experiments where they think like oh my god what have i done and why did i make this so ex so huge and why is there so many experimental units so many hundreds of pots or petri dishes or thousands of petri dishes when that happens also take a breath and just set up a smaller, much more straightforward study where you have very few factors that you concentrate on, where you have a limited set of response variables. And you know, if the simple, ex if the complex experiment failed, you have the simple experiment to um, work with. You can also enrich a data set, not only at the experimental design stage, so by making the design more and more complex with more and more factors and levels and whatever have you, you can also enrich the results of a simple experiment that maybe only had one factor and maybe only one or two sampling times by just measuring more things. But then you had an experiment that already worked, so that time is already basically in your favor. And now you can maybe not just measure, let's say, fungal biomass and soil, but also bacterial biomass or archaea. And maybe you can look at other organism groups and process rates than you had initially intended to do. So remember that these complex experiments that we are all somehow getting away, <laughs> the, our imagination gets sort of carried away with these complex experiments. Remember to also really set up some simple experiments that have a much higher chance of actually working and, and showing something and then when they do you can make the story more complete by measuring more parameters. I think this is <laughs> very important to remember. And a final point I think is the open question. So very many times we design experiments with a specific result in mind and then basically only that specific result is really of interest. And that can really be a recipe for failure. And then, you know, you lose time by not getting the one result that was interesting. So, for example, if you really needed an interaction term to be significant, like one factor really depending on the level of the other factor. Um, or for in, in our case, uh, in, uh, there was, for example, these priming experiments where really the entire analysis depended on fungus experiencing a previously mild stimulus then better dealing with a subsequent harsher potentially lethal and dangerous stimulus so if you don't have that response right then the data don't help you in the end even though the experiment per se worked i mean things didn't catastrophically fail like due to contamination or equipment failure so there was an experiment it actually worked but it didn't tell you <laughs> it didn't have the result that you expected now, those are actually in many ways the worst experiment. <laughs> Sometimes you have no choice because this is what the grant proposal or the topic of your PhD is, right? But those are in many ways sometimes the, the worst experiments to set up because there's only one way that the experiments really help you and become interesting. It's much better when given the opportunity to design a more open question, like what happens, not is there really stress priming 
i.e. does the fungus work better when it has a mild stimulus and then a subsequently more uh, damaging stimulus. This is only direction, one direction of the results basically fulfill that requirement and would make you happy. But what if you asked, how does a fungus deal with subsequent stimuli? One being milder, the, un being, the other one being more severe, for example. It's a simple shift of perspective. And then, for example, you might find, well, for some fungi, it's actually worse if they have this initial stimulus. It's not a warning, it doesn't help them, it just makes things worse. Some fungi simply don't care. And actually, we had one outcome where we had exactly all these cases. So it actually made the story in many ways more interesting when you did not just hone in on one particular outcome. So if you can somehow, in the design stage of an experiment and a study, think about how can I ask a question such that any answer to this question is going to be interesting, then I think you're much better off than if it's just one particular outcome, one constellation that is of interest. And therefore, it's much more likely to also work out and yield a chapter of your PhD in the end. So I think this is something that many people don't often consider, but if you have the choice, as I said, sometimes the topic doesn't allow that, but you, if you have the choice, try to, op to ask as much as possible an open question where that biological or ecological system that you're studying is giving you something and then no matter which direction or magnitude the effect was, you learn something and it was interesting and moves things forward. Right, so that's where my points for thesis insurance. I think it's important to think of those in the beginning already, right? A lot of those were design aspects, but also how do you, you know, shift gears when things work and not the way you thought they would. So it's important to think about this in the beginning, not when things have already gone wrong, because very many times then it may be too late. This is a limited time frame. Remember those three, four years, um, they will go by really fast. And so it's good to think of these thesis insurance options right from the start. And with that, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.